here. Have you sent your gift to Shepard yet? Bring it up. <laughs> How's that for a good spot, friends? <laughs> Speaking of bad news, oh, there's a lot of things that can change. You know, I'm, I'm here to report on things. That's what I do. And I, I notice for those of you who are living uh, in the boondocks, New York has taken a, uh, an interesting turn this Christmas. And for those of you who are Christmas uh, students, you know, of the very... Everybody always talks about how Christmas changes. And, uh, and uh, it does. It's a really specific, in specific instances it changes. For example... Uh, I notice now that they're playing music in Times Square. You know, these big uh, loudspeakers play music now. It wasn't so long ago when uh, you'd walk through Times Square and the music would play. You'd hear, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. You know, and uh, Christmas type stuff. And, uh, but of course, Christmas has become uh, controversial. And uh, so, uh, no longer are people allowed to have any Christmas, really. <laughs> I mean, officially. So, uh, it's, uh, uh, oh yeah, without somebody taking it to the Supreme Court. And so uh, a few years before that, you used to hear them, uh, they'd have these big loudspeakers. And I remember, you know, right here in Times Square, not so long ago, you'd hear the loudspeakers, and they would be playing, Hot night, holy night. Oh, that's, that's out. I mean, that's, that is gone. I mean, you can't have a loudspeaker that's playing that out right next to uh, I Am Curious Yellow. And uh, that's, uh, of course, you know... Uh, <laughs> Times Square has become the Babylon of the world. I mean, this is the flesh pot capital of, of, of the entire universe. I mean, hey, did you know that in Paris, a pornography is almost totally unknown, like we have it in New York? It's the truth. They think it's in fantastically bad taste. <laughs> and it is. And there's only two countries that are totally hung on this stuff, Scandinavia and America. And they're both countries with sex problems. That's right. Everybody who thinks Swedish girls are sex, forget it, friend. Forget it. That's only in the movies. Movies are not the same as life. But that, nevertheless, uh, uh, I, uh, oh, this is an interesting show. It's taken a fascinating turn. But uh, uh, I was walking through Times Square the other night, and uh, I want to report, for those of you who are outside of New York and you're out there in the boondocks, what the music is this year in New York now. They're playing for the uh, official Christmas-type music. It's Barbara Streisand. And she, yeah, she sings, you know how she sings through her nose? Oh, second hand girl, oh, second hand girl. And so it is surrounding me on Times Square, and I realize that uh, this is this year's sound of Times Square music. Last year's sound... Uh, for something else again. Do you remember just a few years ago when, when playing out all over uh, Times Square, they had the sound of, what was that guy who was making those records that were very popular for a while with the chipmunk? Do you remember the ones with the chipmunk? Those records? Whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> you remember somebody and his chipmunk? They were, they were kind of little squeaky voices. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm going to get the report here from our trivia expert. Yes? Ross Bactasarian. Oh, I see. Saroyan's cousin. Yeah, you not, might know it. All right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so things are, are really changing. By the way, speaking of uh, Christmas, we've gotten a couple of requests from people that we're going to read uh, the Red Rider and his BB gun. Yes, we are going to do Red Rider and his BB gun over Christmas. The Red Rider... BB gun story out of my book. And also, uh, the next night, I'm going to do The Return of the Smiling Wimpy Doll, which is another one of my Christmas stories, which I've been requested to do. You know, speaking of uh, of uh, the, the changing times that we're in, uh, I, did you know that one of the catalogs, uh, I got a catalog from Neiman Marcus that was sent to me, you know, for Christmas suggestions. 
And one of the suggestions that Neiman Marcus has available now, his and her matched Cessna aircraft. How is that for a grandiose Christmas gift? Now, for those of you who are curious as to what type of Cessna they were talking about, if you're a flyer, it was the 172 in this particular case, but with matching color or a contrasting matching color. And they're monogrammed with the her monogram on the rudder and his monogram on his rudder. And uh, kind of nice, isn't it? With, with a special Christmas type of naga hide imitation uh, alligator upholstery in it and all that stuff. Now, for those of you who are curious what a, what a little uh, dingbat like that will go for with the uh, proper equipment in it, I would say roughly uh, close to 20 Gs per one. <laughs> for the two of them are on. Oh, well, you could pro- probably pick up a pair for around 40 grand. And I think this is really playing Christmas. Really playing Christmas big. And, you know, speaking of, uh, of uh, you know, the approaching Christmas, uh, this this is a couple of days before Christmas. You know, this marks one of my more important anniversaries. One of the very few actual victories that I have had in my professional career. A true victory. And it came about in a kind of an unstudied, un, uh, inadvertent way, completely inadvertent. Uh, I, I, I was hung on this girl. It had happened in school. And her name was Eileen Akers. Now, you see, everybody, uh, just sit there for a minute, uh, if you're a male type, and, and close your eyes for a second. And think of the names of the various girls. Now, this is only a male thing. The names of the various girls that you had a momentary fantastic crush on when you were in school. Can you remember their names? Well, there were three major crushes that I remember having in grade school. Major crushes. That really got me... <laughs> I mean, really... Uh, and, uh, these names still have a magic mystery sound to them when you say it, you know? And uh, I remember Eileen Akers was always sort of mysterious to me anyway because she was up in the front of the room. And I was always in the back of the room. I was back with the S's. She was up with the A's. And we were forever separated by two-thirds of the alphabet. All, you know, this great lump of cloddish people between us, George Doppler and Joshua and that whole crowd were in between us all the time. And she never knew that I had anything on. You know, she just never, as far as I know, never realized that I was hung on her. And even her brother, she had this brother named Larry. And he was sort of a pimply-faced guy, about two grades ahead of us, kind of a round face type. And just because I was hung on her, I really had a hang-up on this girl, even Larry began to have a mysterious, exotic look. He said, he lives in the same house with uh, this... uh, you know, this girl, uh, I was, and I, I, don't ask me why I was hung on her. I remember now she was a real skinny girl, had big black rimmed glasses. And uh, there she was, always sitting up in the front there, right in the front of the room, way up there by the board. And I'd see the back of her head all the time. Well, she was in the glee club. Now, I had no more interest in the glee club than I have in taking up the uh, study of the economic situation of Pango Pango. I had no interest whatsoever in the Glee Club. As a matter of fact, if anything, I had a negative interest in the Glee Club. Because I remember some of the most boring times I ever spent in an auditorium was when they would have an auditorium session and the Glee Club would be up on stage and would sing stuff like, Have you baked a cherry pie, Johnny Bentley? They were always singing. <laughs> Uh, and, and I, you know, the Glee Club was a real drag to me, and there were all kinds of real draggy people that were in the Glee Club. Well, Irene Akers was in the Glee Club. And so one day, Miss Robinette, and it was in Miss Robinette's room that this happened, Miss Robinette announced that they were going to have auditions for the Glee Club. Well, of course, immediately Schwartz knew it. Flick threw up into his lunch bucket. And uh, I, secretly, thinking, I'm going to get next to Ivy Nakers now. See? 
I'm going to get extra. So I went down that night to the gym, and they were having auditions for the Glee Club. Now, the way they did it was uh, Miss Nelson, who was the principal and somehow was connected with the Glee Club, Miss Nelson was sitting at this piano, and they would call kids up one by one, or a whole bunch of us sitting in these folding chairs in the gym, and she would call them up one by one, and you would stand next to the piano, and she would say, now, as I play these notes, you sing these notes. And so she goes, bong, 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 and she'd say, now sing that note. And you go, uh, uh, uh. And then she says, now, bong, 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 uh, uh, uh. Like a fool. See, a whole bunch of kids are doing this stuff. So I figure, what the hell? You know, the rest of the kids are doing it too. And this was my way of getting next to this chick. Already I was hung on chicks. And it was Eileen Akers. Well, there must have been 50 kids trying out for the Glee Club. And uh, she's playing the piano. Miss Miss uh, Nelson always wore purple dresses, I remember, at places piano. Well, she finishes the whole thing. There's a brief huddle with Miss Mino and a couple of other teachers. When one of them got up and says, the following boys and girls will please stay in the gymnasium. The rest of you will be dismissed. And thank you for coming out here. And uh, thank you for trying. But uh, we only had six places open on a Greek club. And the following will please stay. Guess whose name led the rest? Shepard, the non-singer. Now, the point I'm making here, I couldn't sing. But the motivation of trying to get next to this chick, Ivy Nakers, was such that I even completely surmounted a total lack of talent. I just wondered. <laughs> I was inspired. Speaking of lack of talent, this is W.O.R. <laughs> oh, now, you know, you got me all excited now. I'm thinking about Ivy Nakers. So uh, I, I, I was chosen for the Glee Club. Now, first of all, this was embarrassing. Now I'm in. Oh, boy, you commit yourself, see, and I'm in. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I'm kind of pleased about the old idea, you see. And so this happened early in the year. This was like in September, you see. I was in the Glee Club. And so every week we would meet the Glee Club. We would meet on Wednesdays at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we would always let out the last uh, period in school, and the Glee Club would meet in the gym and Miss Nelson or Miss Bundy or somebody would play the piano, and we would do these fantastically boring numbers. We sang the worst stuff. I'll tell you the kind of stuff we sang. We sang, uh, Can you bake a cherry pie, darling Billy? I can bake a cherry pie. You remember that song? Then we used to sing, There's a little... What was that one now? Come, 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 come. Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-
And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they're way down the other end. And I am, and I'm bugging now. I can't get out. It was a total flopperoonie. I was further away from Eileen Akers when we were singing in the Glee Club than I was in class. And we used to, every every miserable Thursday afternoon, I would spend three and a half hours going, zum, 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 Then we had another one. We did the Yankee Turtle Comes to Town. And, <laughs> and it was all in fantastic part singing. Except that the basses had nothing to do in that one. Except that once in a while we would say, Yankee Doodle. And then they'd go, Come to town. Da, 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 da. We were the comedy relief in that one. we go, Yankee Doodle. Me and, and two other guys. Jack Morton was one of them. <laughs> Me and Jack Morton and Freddie Martin. we go, Yankee Doodle. We were the bass section. Well, you know, it got to be kind of a dragon. First of all, I was also made a social pariah in my set. My set was not exactly the Glee Club set. Uh, my set was the set that went in heavily for, oh, uh, breaking insulators. Uh, <laughs> we went in heavily for siphoning gas. Uh, we were, we were, <laughs> we were known for, uh, fist fighting, uh, uh, you know, swearing and all that stuff. And I had been euchred into the Glee Club. Well, I was figuring, you see, after the, after the year was over, you know, the end of the year came in something like January, February, you know, right after the Christmas holiday. I was going to split, you know. I'd get out of Miss Robinette's class. That's the end of the ball game, you know. What the hell with this thing? Well, little did I realize that I was destined for fame. I am so bored with the Glee Club, I can't stand it. Is there anybody out there that was in the Glee Club? You mean you really like it? You volunteered for it? The only reason I went for it was because of this chick. That's a, that's a fact. You know, I've, I've come to believe, seriously, that almost everything men do in this world is because of a woman for one reason or another. Do you think that's true, Herb? <laughs> do you think that's true, Jim? Well, I'm, I'm convinced. I'm really convinced. I wonder how many guys have become a hippie because they, you know, they're, they're, they're chick, uh, he keeps putting down the square world. And he's, you know, the square's a bear, you know. And so, so here he is, he's got long hair, and he, he really secretly likes baths. And, and the, he can't stand cheap Italian wine, but here he's playing the scene big. Well, I'll tell you, I was playing the Greek club thing big, big. I had this green songbook that they issued to us, and oh, I hated it. We used to sing Billy Boy. That this is a, can you bake a cherry pie? That was coming out of my ears. Then we were singing things like the little brown church in the veil. Oh, another one we used to sing all the time was, uh, Way down upon the Swanee River, la da 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 You know that one? Groovy tune. Oh, yes. We used to sing Jeannie with the light brown hair. Of course, you know the usual uh, cheap, jivery type humor that I got on that one. You know, Jeannie with the light brown hair and all that stuff. Well, the Greek club was a total bust as far as I was concerned. And I couldn't get out of it. I had to fake it through. Three days before Christmas. It is now a Thursday. I can hardly wait for Christmas. You know how Christmas approaches when you're in school like like some glacier? I mean, it's, it's a giant thing. It, it's a, some, you know, not maybe necessarily the holiday itself, but the fact there's a vacation, a Christmas vacation, the whole excitement of getting out of school and you know, it's a, and, 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 and in the Warren G. Harding School, Christmas was a big deal. Eh? I mean, everywhere you looked, uh, people are making uh, uh, Christmas trees on a green paper. Oh, I was cutting out Christmas trees. You're making ornaments. And you know those long chains you make out of paper that you glue together? And, and the whole business of taking uh, popcorn and stringing it on strings. Oh, you know, everybody's all excited. See? And, oh, right in the middle of it all, i got to go to this crummy glee club rehearsal. See? So I'm done at the glee club rehearsal. I'm dragging you to the gym. And there's Jack Morton down there and Freddie Martin and all the guys are there. Stan Roper, who's there. Stan Roper's the only true boy soprano I ever knew. And the, by the way, the only true boy soprano I ever knew who also, at the same time, chewed the uh, Lucky Tiger chewing tobacco. So don't, don't, uh, don't get smart with Stanley Roper just because he's got a high, squeaky voice. <laughs> oh, is he a tough mother, I'll tell you. So, uh, nevertheless, we come drifting in. It's Christmas time, you know, just before we... And the end of the semester is coming. Little did I realize a bombshell is about to be dropped right on the Glee Club. 
And the one thing I'm looking forward to is two weeks off. Two weeks when I do nothing but shoot my kid brother with my BB gun. Two weeks when I go out and break insulators with Flick and Schwartz. Two weeks when, you know, go skating and all that. And by the way, this was the Christmas. I remember this thing like this was the Christmas that for at least, oh, two months before I had laid the groundwork, I wanted a pair of racing skates. Really good ice skates, you know, shoe skates, racing skates. Man, I could hardly wait because I figured I was going to get them, you see. And I was, I could just taste it. Well, I'm now in the gym. And we're all sort of fooling around. You know how just before something is about to happen, before a class, before a rehearsal or a practice, guys sort of fool around and hit each other and, you know, push around and yell and stuff. And we're banging around and hollering, and I'm showing off for Eileen Akers, you see. I still have a, a sad uh, uh, a sad residual hang-up on this chick. I've given up, you know, but the, I'm, I never really totally give up. So I'm hitting Jack Morton, and I'm watching her out of the corner of my eye. She's over by the piano. When Miss Norton comes in, and she takes her hands, and she goes on the piano and goes like this, Bam! She makes a big chord like that. She says, boys and girls, now I want all of you to sit down on the floor for one moment. We have something very special to announce tonight before we begin rehearsal. And now I have a surprise for you, too. And the surprise is this. We're not going to have a rehearsal tonight. We're going to let you out of school an hour early tonight. Of course, everybody with lips. Shepherd with. She's but now, just one moment now. Before we leave, I have a special announcement. I'll be quiet, all of you. And everybody sits down. What is this thing? Because she had a look in the eye, like she's swallowed a cat or something. See? She says, I have just received information that one of our Glee Club members has been selected for the all-high school and the all-school Hammond Glee Club that will perform over the Christmas holidays and will sing on the radio. And I'm sitting there, I'm hitting Morton, you know, and Morton's kicking me in the behind, you know, and I'm spitting, you know. <laughs> and she says, and... It is Gene Shepard. <laughs> what the? <laughs> you can see everybody turn. The whole Greek club turns. You know, looks at me. I says, oh, come on. I couldn't believe it. It's the only time in my life that I ever was really picked for anything. And everybody leaves. Of course, a lot of yelling and hollering and that uh, Jack Morton makes a couple of obscene remarks. <laughs> and all the girls are looking. I was the only one picked. Well, Miss Norton comes over to me. I'm the last one in the gym now. I'm crushed. I can't figure it out. She says, uh, I've just been notified. We, we submitted your name and two other people. And you have been picked. And we're so proud of you, Jean, that you have been picked along with three other students from George Rogers Clark and one from Columbia and one from Whiting, and you're going to be the lead in the bass section. Why do you do? Well, do I have to tell you what happened? Right? It's Christmas, right? Where do you think I spent Christmas? Christmas Eve? That's right. Me and 75 other kids wearing angel-type costumes with the long white robes, you know, with the big stiff collars. They gave us white robes. And, oh, all the girls, incidentally, in this uh, Greek club that we were part of, wore this light, angelic blue robe. And all the boys wore white robes. And they gave each of us this long robe to wear. And for three days before Christmas, 
every afternoon I was left out of school. They allowed me to go out of school at one, and I had to go down to the Civic Center and rehearse singing Silent Night. And the, now, what does the bass part sing in Silent Night? You're curious? They go, so, here, the, the, the sopranos and the altos are singing Silent Night. The altos go, Silent Night. That's the way the altos go. And the bass says, Silent night, silent night, silent night, silent night. So we just sing all silent night. Stars are bright, 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 silent night. That was the part. I still remember that idiotic part. And <laughs> so we're rehearsing this thing three days. Christmas comes. Everybody's running around having a groovy time. Christmas? Oh, no. Shepard and 75 other kids are standing on the steps of the Civic Center in the freezing cold, singing Silent Night to a large, ravaging crowd of eight guys who are in between shifts at the steel mill. <laughs> so, Christmas comes and goes. And for four straight days, while everybody else is out ice skating and playing hockey... Guess where I was? Standing on the end going, Silent night, silent night, silent night. Bells, bells, stars are bright, stars are bright. Oh. And I had to survive the jibes and the unfriendly. You should have seen what Flick said about my robe. I had this white robe. <laughs> yeah, I remember him standing in a whole bunch of crowd of kids all watching us sing. And we sang on the radio. By the way, that was my first appearance on the radio. We sang on the radio. And I remember being fascinated by this announcer. You know, the radio was such a big deal. And uh, the announcer, local radio station, saying he's got this hair all flicked up, you know, neat, jazzy, Tony Martin type of old collar. You know, a real sharpie type guy. And he says, and now from the steps of the Civic Center, we bring you live the old school chorus and glee club singing a special selection of Christmas melodies. And then we play little chimes and we started to sing. But you know, that changed my whole life. Now, it really did. I've never forgotten that moment. That moment of, uh, of uh, being picked on something. For, for a talent that I had no idea that I possessed. And I was a good bass, actually. My, my voice changed when I was five and became a deep, resounding bass. And uh, <laughs> it's been that way ever since. <laughs> and so, of course, I had an unfair advantage over all the rest of the kids. And even when I taught, my voice was always like this. And, uh, and that moment, though, getting picked, and I remember standing on the stage in the Civic Center... On Christmas Day, they had this big concert, and everybody came. There was, must have been 2,000 people in the audience. Now, I remember my mother, my father, sitting down there, way down. I could see him way down in front of my kid brother, and there I am up on the stage, and the curtain goes up, and the lights play on you. And, the, and the, out there in front was this lady. We had a, a lady from George Rogers Clark who was a famous music choral director. And uh, have you ever stood in front? Have you ever been in a choir? And watched one of these ladies work. Uh, they sing everything along with it. You know, they go, <laughs> their voice goes up and down. And she was like some giant fish in front of us, moving up and down. And all I was doing was going, zum, zum, zum. She, that's the one part she didn't sing. Zum, zum, zum. Way down in, in the church in the wild wood. Zum, zum. Wild wood. Zum, zum. Well, <laughs> that, that, uh, that little victory. Of, uh, of being picked for this thing and the light shining. And that was really the first time in my life that I could honestly say that I was on a stage and the audience was out there. Now, most people all of their lives are in the audience. And uh, they have never really been up on the stage. And it'll turn you. Oh, boy. It really turns you on. And I remember... Uh, one of the things that was particularly uh, groovy about this 
was getting him free. <laughs> you know, they charge a dollar and a half for everybody to come and hear this big thing, this all-school choir and glee club. And uh, it was a big deal. You know, everybody in town came, and uh, they had a program, and the, the mayor was there and all that stuff. They charged a dollar and a half, but I got him free. And furthermore, because I was a performer, I was given two free tickets to give to people, like my mother and father. And what a great, what a great feeding that was. And then, probably the wildest feeding of all was to go home later, after this was all over, after the the uh, afternoon when we sang on the radio. It was actually recorded that we were not live on the radio. They. Uh, we, we were up on the steps of the Civic Center, and it was one of those cold days, and, and we sang, and they picked it up, and they announced it would be on the radio that night at 8 o'clock. And then I remember listening to the radio. My mother and everybody, my mother called my Aunt Glenn. <laughs> my Aunt Glenn called my Aunt Teresa. My Aunt Teresa called my Aunt Kate. And all, all over, they're all sitting there listening to the radio. And on it came at the Glee Club to actually hear it on the radio. And I could hear myself, or I, you know, I imagined I could anyway, you know, I could hear some, some, some. <laughs> well, that, that, that moment was, was a, was a great moment of, of, of total, total victory. And you know, the curious, they had a curious aftermath. I had been picked, the only one out of the Glee Club to make it in the all, all city high school chorus and Glee Club. And Eileen Akers flipped. I was suddenly in. Instead of just being, you know, with, with the boys. And, just, and curiously enough, I found that I didn't like Eileen Akers. <laughs> oh, you know, you, you begin to throw your weight around. Well, that Christmas, that, that, that Glee Club Christmas, is still a legend in our family. In fact... As far as my mother is concerned, that's, on, that's the only time that I really was on the radio. I'm serious. My mother, my, and, and they sent everybody, the radio station that we were on, sent everybody a recording, everybody, all the kids that were in this thing. They sent them a recording of this program that we did. And we did things like Silent Night, uh, uh, you know, We Three Kings of Orient are... Bearing gifts, we traverse apart. Uh, we did that one. Uh, we did, uh, all, you know, all the standard Christmas carols and so forth. But uh, everybody got a got a, uh, a record of this thing, and it was it was a big, uh, you know, uh, seventy eight. And my mother, this is one of my mother's treasured, prized possessions. The time I was on the radio. Yeah, and she uh, she still has it. I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking to her. I said, "Hi, ma." And, uh, you know, it was Christmas time. I gave her a call home. I said, hi, Ma, how is it? How is everything going? She says, oh, we've been playing the record. Do you remember the time you were on the radio? I said, yes, Ma, I remember the time I was on the radio. She said, well, do you remember the time you were on the radio? We often talk about it. Aunt Glenn says uh, she remembers how how wonderful it was when you were on the radio. And uh, we've been playing your record for Christmas. <laughs> the time I was on the radio. And so these, these, uh, these things keep... Uh, keep echoing back and forth. And this is the one thing that most people in my hometown remember me for. I was in the Glee Club. And uh, I remember one time, oh, I was in the Army, out of the Army, years later, walking down the street. And it was a cold winter day. I've just gotten out of the Army. And who do I meet coming down the street looking exactly like she always looked? Miss Norton. Miss Norton who had been the principal of the school. I had no idea she remembered me, because this was from grade school. Walked off. She says, why? It's Jean Shepard. So, yeah, hi. Because <laughs> she was such a fantastic figure of, of uh, authority. I mean, Miss Norton was the principal of the school. And I remember that when she would get up on the stage, you could hear her girdle creaking. She was, boy, a tough lady. had this iron gray hair. And so... I said, to, hello, Miss Norton. She said, why, you've grown. Yeah, I did, yeah, that's true. You know how it is. I was only three feet tall when I was in this Robinette. I guess I grew a little bit now. But she says, well, you certainly have. You know, I often, I often talk about you 
She says, it would be nice if you had come to school and talked to all the children in the glee club. I talked to the kids. <laughs> it was practically out of my mind. I said, talk to the kids in the glee club? She says, yes, sir. You were such a fine singer. She said, that I often wondered why you didn't do anything with your singing. Well, she hit me right, right, left. I'll tell you, you know, it's not often that somebody says, do something with your singing. I said, well, you know how it is. Uh, I uh, I play the uh, Jews harp a little bit, uh, you know, and I tap dance a little, but uh, I haven't. She said, why don't you come tomorrow afternoon and talk to the children in the glee club? Well, you know, I did that. I don't think I've ever told this story. I have never told this story. And the next afternoon, it was right just before Christmas, I went down to the Warren G. Harding School, which looked so tiny. It looked like it was made out of little Aspen boxes or something. <laughs> and I went to the Warren G. Harding School. Miss Norton was still principal. And I went to the office where she was. And I walked in and I said, uh, Miss Norton, uh, I'm here. You know, were you serious about your invitation? Oh, I'm so pleased. She says, oh, Miss Robinette will be pleased to see you again. And sure enough, five minutes later, there is Miss Robinette. I never knew she was such a little lady. I never thought she was big, you know. And here's Miss Robinette. She comes about up to my clavicle, you know. And I'm looking down at her. And five minutes later, I'm in the gym. And here's a whole bunch of little kids sitting with their legs all crossed, looking up at me. And Miss Norton says, boys and girls, we're very, very honored today to have somebody who was one of the best people we ever had in our Greek club. And that he was the only one ever picked from Warren G. Harding School to be on the All-City Choir and Glee Club. And here he is, and I'm, I'm sure that the, all of you would like, to, would like to hear him sing or talk to you and tell you about uh, how it was on the Glee Club. Would you please talk? And this is Gene Shepherd, who went to the Warren Harding School. I put down at these little kids. They were all little kids. I was sitting there. And I could see a couple of kids were still hitting each other in the back, you know. <laughs> There's another Schwartz and another Flick and another Shepherd coming up, you know. And I looked down and I said, all right, now come on, cut it out in the back there. I said, now cut it out. And they all looked up at me. I said, to Miss Norton, I said, Miss Norton, would you please step to the piano? She said, well, I'd be pleased to. And she sat down at the piano. I said, uh, Miss Norton, would you please uh, play, uh, uh, you know the one? And she said, why, of course I know the one. And so she starts to play the lead melody. And you make a gently pie, da, 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 da. And I'm going... Zum, 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 zum. And all the kids are watching me, and I can see five or six of the bases are applauding. They've got other kids. And then we stopped after the number, and it was a tremendous roar of applause. And I said, kids, if you practice hard, and if you uh, gargle with Listerine regularly, and if you do push-ups, and you listen to what Miss Norton says, you too will grow up and be famous. Maybe you'll get picked on me. All City Choir and Glee Club. And I just want to tell you that uh, it's good to be here. Back at the war on G. Harding School. All the kids looked at me, you know, with that fantastic generation.